Good evening. We'll make a start. Um, there are still people joining us, but I think we'll, uh, we'll get going. Um, I'm delighted to welcome here, you here to the Melbourne School of Design uh, for this lecture by David Buckland, Climate is Culture, the Cape Farewell Project. Uh, my name is John Wiseman. I'm Deputy Director of the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute here at the University of Melbourne. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on the ancestral land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, it strikes me that in relation to this particular topic, it's important not only to acknowledge the land on which we are on, uh, but also to recognise the learning, the lessons that we can draw uh, from Indigenous peoples uh, in Australia and beyond, and the ways in which the struggles to deal with all sorts of challenges, all sorts of challenges to resilience continue, uh, including in relation to the struggle to protect remote communities in Western Australia. And I think there is a great deal that we can learn uh, from uh, the kind of discussions we're having tonight uh, on that issue. Tonight's lecture, which is part of the Art Plus Climate Equals Change Festival, has been organised by ClimArt in collaboration with the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute, the Melbourne School of Design, the European Union Centre on Shared Complex Challenges, and the Potter Museum of Art. And we're very grateful to all of them for their assistance with tonight's event. Uh, a few little um, uh, pieces of information. You'll notice we've got a number of Twitter tags there. Please feel free to, to use them. Um, I do need to let you know that the lecture tonight's being recorded and filmed, and we hope to be able to make that available to you and to others uh, on our website before too long. Um, I do need to also do the usual reminder, please turn off your mobile phones if you haven't already done so. The format tonight will be as follows. Um, following a couple of brief introductory remarks by uh, Judith Downs from Bank MECU and Guy Abrahams from Climart, I'll introduce uh, David Buckland who will speak for about 45 minutes. Um, that'll be followed by an opportunity for questions with the evening finishing uh, around 8.15 certainly not later than that. I do want to uh, begin um, by asking uh, Judith Downs to say a few words. Judith is the chair of the board of Bank MECU, who have been a, a key sponsor, uh, a key uh, supporter of the, the Climart Festival. Uh, so um, I should say that uh, by way of introduction, uh, Judith's most recent position was as Chief Financial Officer with Illumina Limited. She is now, I should say, Chair of the Board of Bank MECU. Prior to that, uh, she worked for 12 years with ANZ Bank Group, where she held the position of Chief Financial Officer and Chief Operating Officer for the Institutional Division. She's currently an Honorary Visiting Fellow at the University of Melbourne Centre for Accounting and Industry Partnerships and sits on the University Finance Committee. Um, Judith, can I ask you to come forward and say a few words? Thank you, Professor Wiseman. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay respects to their elders past and present. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and to have the opportunity to speak to you. Bank MECU is very proud to be the responsible banking partner of Art plus Climate equals Change. As a responsible bank, we genuinely care about the way we do business, how we look after our customers, and the impacts and legacy we leave behind. Our bank is customer owned, which means that our only shareholders guiding our decisions are our customers. As a bank, we try to do as much as we can to be environmentally responsible. We believe we have a role to lead the way in thinking about our effect on the environment and our contribution to climate change. 
We do this through our own initiatives and through supporting the work of others. Our Conservation Land Bank is one of those initiatives. It's an area of almost a thousand hectares of land in Western Victoria that we have purchased and that we manage on behalf of our customers. At the Land Bank, we plant native trees and protect the natural habitat from destruction and development. We tie these activities to our products by providing carbon and biodiversity offsets with the aim of balancing the negative impact that our products, such as car loans, may have on the environment. We believe this to be the first time a bank has taken an initiative of this kind. We also show our environmental responsibility through our support of important events such as Art Plus Harness Equals Change Festival. Harnessing creativity to show what we face losing if we don't protect our planet is a powerful way to convey the climate change message. And sell-out events like tonight's lecture show just how motivated people are to learn about what more can be done and to extend and challenge their thinking. We are pleased to have the opportunity to be part of such a high caliber organization artists and international guests such as David Buckland. We're also proud to share this festival with our customers who we know are most supportive of our involvement and very engaged in climate action. I'd also like to thank Guy and Bronwyn from Climate Art for asking us to support the festival. Thank you and I hope you enjoy this lecture. I'd now, in a second, going to introduce um, Guy Abrahams. Um, as Judith just said, um, there have been all sorts of people involved in the organisation of the Art Plus Climate Equals Change Festival, but uh, I know, and I think many of us know, just how much work um, Guy Abrahams and Bronwyn Johnson have put into this um, extraordinary collection of exhibitions and events. So I'm really delighted to be able to, to ask Guy to say a few words. Um, Guy is co-founder and CEO of Climart. Um, he was, uh, previous to that, a, a lawyer um, and previous also uh, has been director of the Christine Abrahams Gallery uh, for many years. He's been a board member of the Melbourne Art Fair and the National Gallery of Victoria Art Foundation and president of the Australian Commercial Galleries Association. He's also currently chair of the City of Melbourne Art and Heritage Acquisitions Panel, but I suspect uh, at least for the last few months, if not longer, um, his uh, heart and soul has been very much involved in this, uh, this festival and this event. So, Guy, would you like to come and say a few words? Thank you very much, John, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we're absolutely thrilled to have uh, this event as part of the Art Plus Climate Equals Change Festival, uh, one of a number of big keynote and public forums that are part of our program. The program continues to run until the 17th of May uh, with 25 exhibitions and a whole lot more talking to be done. So I would urge you to have a look at the programs. Hopefully you've picked up on the way in uh, and see what else you can attend over the next two or three weeks. We're particularly thrilled to have David Buckland here, the founder of Cape Farewell. Um, David's work is something that I've been following for many years and been a great admirer of and I'm very pleased to be able to say that this is the first time well, we've been able to bring David to Australia for the first time uh, and also to stage an exhibition, a survey exhibition of his work which is on show right now at the uh, Dulux Gallery on the ground floor of this, of this magnificent building. So if it's open this evening on your way out, um, please drop in and have a look, but otherwise uh, do come back and have a look at, at the range of work that David's been producing as an artist, um, as well as his uh, incredible uh, activities uh, with Cape Farewell organisation. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank, uh, as John did, our co-hosts, uh, the European Union Centre on Shared Complex Challenges, uh, the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute and John's uh, great work and assistance, I have to say, in bringing uh, this festival, and especially its, uh, its uh, appearance at the University of Melbourne, um, to fruition. 
the Melbourne School of Design, Faculty of Art, Architecture, Building and Planning, and of course the Ian Potter Museum of Art and its director, Kelly Galatley, who have also been key in bringing together many of these events. And I'd like to thank our wonderful and brave partners, uh, because let me tell you, not everyone out there is willing to support uh, events uh, or um, uh, let's just say events, uh, that discuss <laughs> issues such as climate change. Uh, and that's a shame, but what we are hoping to do with this festival is allow people another way into the discussion. And I think uh, everyone can engage and relate to art, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. But thank you very much to our principal partners, uh, Mr David Lease of the Billard Lease Partnership and the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. Of course, our principal knowledge partner, the University of Melbourne, our amazing responsible banking partner, uh, Bank MECU, and thank you, Judith, for your comments. Our government partner, Creative Victoria, and our clean energy partner, uh, Diamond Energy. Thank you to them all and all, also to our many other sponsors who you'll see listed on our program. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks very much. So now let me introduce uh, briefly David and give him the floor. So David Buckland is a designer, artist and filmmaker whose works have been exhibited in and collected by many prestigious international galleries, including the National Portrait Gallery in London, the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris, the Metropolitan Museum in New York and the Getty Collection in Los Angeles. But as David will, I'm sure, tell you, in 2001 he created and now directs the Cape Farewell Project, which uh, is based in London, but works uh, on an international scale, bringing together artists and cultural workers, scientists and communicators to stimulate, inspire a cultural narrative about the urgency of the global climate challenge. David has co-curated a number of major climate art exhibitions, including Art and Climate Change for the National History Museum London, Earth for the Royal Society of Arts, Carbon 12 for the EDF Foundation Gallery in Paris, Carbon 13 for the Ballroom in Texas, and the Carbon 14 Festival in Toronto. He's also produced a number of important films highlighting the link between the work of artists and climate scientists, including Burning Ice with Sundance and Art from the Arctic with the BBC. And I'm sure you'll see uh, some examples of this work this evening. David's going to speak for about 45 minutes. Uh, and then there will definitely be an opportunity for questions straight after that. So I'd like you to welcome David Buckland, please. Thank you, John um, and Guy. Congratulations on bringing this festival to, the, to life, and it's wonderful to see you all here. Um, we'll start with this. People say that artists should suffer for their work. Well, this is me. <laughs> it was, um, I was on the west coast, no, east coast of Greenland, and it was part of, you know, it was three of us, and we were with, with Inu, uh, Inuit folk, and we were with dogs, and we went out on the ice, sea ice, and all the way down the coast, a journey of about 240 miles, um, sleeping out in the snow, and it was between minus 30 and minus 45. It was the meanest, most brutal thing I've ever done, and I'm never doing it again. But it was an experience. Um, when I started Cape Farewell, as John and Guy said, that you know, I came with it as an artist, and I started working with some climate scientists. And um, they were oceanographers down in Southampton and mathematical modelers. And I was kind of working with them in, in order to create a piece of art. And they said, well, why is nobody listening to us? You know, this is 15 years ago. Climate really wasn't on anybody's real agenda in the public domain. I mean, there were a lot of people who knew a lot about it, but it wasn't out there. And I was thinking, well, you know, your, your language is graphs. Your language is data. And that's not the communication tool that really reaches out to the public. So I thought, well, OK, there must be a way of kind of involving the creative sector. So we came up with this proposal of actually sailing way up into the Arctic, which is, you know, in a way is the front line of climate change, and on this beautiful schooner. And on board we had each time 20 people, a mixture of artists and scientists. And I thought, you know, this would 
just be the beginning and it would be fine, I could do that for a couple of years and then I'll go back to being an art career. Well, I'm still doing it, that's the way it is. But it has been an extraordinary journey. Um, the boat itself was fantastic, it was an amazing bonding experience. You know, you're going for three weeks way up into the Arctic. I mean, you're, we're within 600 miles of the North Pole. I mean, this is a serious, far north experience. And we had the oceanographers on board, and we were measuring the salinity and the temperature of the oceans. We were, you know, trawling for plankton and coccolithophores, doing lots of scientific work. So this was the opportunity for the artist to work with the scientists in the field. You know, you can always work with scientists in, the, in their labs when they come back with all the data and look at it, but actually to go and watch them collect and get the data that everything is experienced on. So that was a great kind of bonding. And also, the other thing was that if we did this on this sailing boat, you know, just publicly it's a very good story. So by doing this, we managed to actually get the BBC to commission the film, which then led to all of the kind of big exposure that we really wanted. And, you know, brought climate into the public domain in quite a serious way. Now, over the period of time since then, we've worked with over 360 artists, uh, creators, architects, writers, filmmakers, poets, musicians. So I'm not going to be able to bring all of that to, your, to this talk, but so I'm going to sort of pepper the whole talk with these kind of artistic interventions. And at the same time, I'm going to really try and say why and also kind of map the journey that I've been on and the everybody else has been on with me. Um, you know, the other thing is that, you know, when we were up in the Arctic, this is, you know, the schooner is, is a big boat. And you suddenly realize just how big the scale of ice is when you're up in the Arctic. It's so inspiring. So the amount of work that came out of it, just by being there, and then layering on the idea of the whole scientific communication on top of that. So that was good enough. We're here in the Monaco Glacier, and what a kind of salient point, and we can map this. If you come from here, which is, I'm on the shore here, and you go straight across, that was where the front of the glacier was 35 years previously. So in 35 years it had retreated that much. I mean, there were certain glaciers that we visited eight years later that had completely disappeared. And the idea that actually the northern ice cap will completely be free of ice, probably within a decade or so. You know, it's quite shocking that human activity is causing something as massive as the northern ice sheet to melt. And, you know, you suddenly realize, oh, wait a minute, this is very, very serious. Um, this is one of the trips. One of the trips, one, we had the boat actually um, in locked in ice so that we landed in Longyearbyen and then we had to do this journey over the period um, with snow scooters getting there, six hours, we drove the snow scooters. Uh, and it was an extraordinary experience to be with those many people so high in the Arctic and actually have the capability to work. And there's some pretty, I mean, Ian McEwen there, Anthony Gormley, Rachel Whiteread. Um, Alex Hartley, uh, Siobhan Davis, you know, there's a really illustrious crew of curators. And I kind of, all the time we were filming them, struggling to make work. So this is the kind of, you know, how do you actually engage? How do you take all of this information, all the science information, the amazing bit, the place that you're in, and climate change is an issue, and then try and struggle to make work? So this is the little film of Ian McEwan up there talking right in the middle of this experience and trying to kind of fathom out how he would approach making a piece of work. I thought maybe I should approach this as a dilemma, really, about long-term interests. We've got ourselves in a situation where we are having to address the needs of people unborn, not our own children, maybe not even our children's children, but, but generations after that. Even the most idealistic of um, thinkers and um, actors on the world stage in the past have really addressed themselves to problems in the present. Um, to bear the weight of the future in this way uh, is both uh, interesting and difficult, and runs probably counter to our nature. And so, I was wondering if there was some way into this subject artistically that would look at it sympathetically from the point of view of that impulse in us that refuses to do this. It's strange to say this. Get on the polluter's side, as it were. I mean, that includes all of us. The consumer, the polluter, the despoiler. 
And we're all sort of weak and lazy and stupid in this respect. Um, David Hinton directed the film, and the way what he's done is intercut. I was actually making these projections of this pregnant woman walking on ice. Um, and it was the idea that, you know, inside this woman was the next generation. And by the time that next generation grows up, the ice won't be there. So that's the kind of metaphor I was playing with. And Ian kind of refers to it in the same way. I think what he, the bit that I really like in this clip is he's talking about the future, the future kind of truth of climate change. I mean, back then you're kind of going, you know, how do you explain it to the public? How do you get the public interested in something that will happen 20 years down the line? You know, what we are doing now will actually, you will only see it in 20 years' time in the real effect, which is why it is such a huge challenge for the political leaders to embrace it and find, make rules now that will stop climate change happening in 20 years' time. So Ian struggled with this concept for... Well, quite a long time, for three years, he kept coming back to me and said, David, I'm committed to writing a novel, but I can't find the structure in which to hold it. I can't find the narrative form. You know, how do you know? I mean, it's a real commitment to write. I mean, it takes two years to write a novel. And he really couldn't find a way of actually telling the story and bringing it into the public. So what happened is that um, there was another scientist in Berlin, John Schellenhuber, had the brilliant idea of actually bringing all the Nobel scientists together and with that kind of massive think tank of brains, they'll come up with a solution of climate change. Well, of course, it didn't happen, but it was a very interesting meeting. Ian was there at the same time and slightly amazed at the huge egos of everybody there. And he's kind of going, well... So then he actually gave him the character to actually base his novel on. And I don't know if you've read Sola, or how many you have, but the, you know, the central character, this is, this is really quite a nasty, misogynist, egotistical male scientist um, who had done all his great work miles earlier, I mean, much earlier in his life, and he's struggling to find meaning in his life. And in a way, you know, it is a metaphor for all of us, and I think that's the way you have to read the book, is that suddenly you know, this person is like, why we can't engage with this problem? We have all this baggage, and actually that stops us kind of in really engaging with climate change and you know, our own personal needs and personal desires and the future truth of it. So after that three years, he said, David, I found it, I found the hook, I found the structure. He then takes two years to write it. And then he managed, you know, the big, big launches, and Ian McEwan book, the media go very excited. What he actually managed to do was to get 10 minutes of prime time television news to talk about climate change. All my scientists' friends were absolutely furious, in some sense, because that's what they would love to have had. But because a novelist came in, because somebody came in with a story to tell, then the news would buy into it. So I think you just understand how powerful the artistic process is in actually engaging with the public. Um, as soon as it came out, a friend sent me this the, a while ago. Um, son, what you can't... Oh, you can see it. It's just that little dot is Earth. And you kind of go, wait a minute, just the scale of it. And you think of the power of that machine, that, that you know, atomic machine, and why can't we just harness the energy from that? And it just kind of... It's sort of, sort of a witty little kind of way of going. Um, I'm just going to deal with the science. Um, the science is why I started this. The science informs everything we do. And it's very, very important to me. The IPCC, um, you know, spent four years writing this extraordinary piece of um, analysis of the situation we're in. And it was published last year. You know, it's a million words long. It's 287, 275 scientists worked flat out for four years. None of them paid in order to study the situation. They worked, in, you know, all in cahoots with each other. And it was peer-reviewed and peer-reviewed, and they struggled. It is the biggest scientific document ever made, you know, ever, ever made in terms of a peer-reviewed kind of structure. They are that serious about it. And me being an artist, I can actually reduce this huge document down to two lines. Um, first of all, they said, the good news is if we really, 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 really manage to engage, we can keep the world rise in temperature down to 1.7. If we just go business as usual, we're up to six degrees. Now, again, these are kind of abstract figures. Why are they important? What's, you know, what do they mean? So, 
If you kind of look 1.7 degrees, we're already at 0.7 degrees. That's how much the world's temperatures, global temperatures, right? And it's already producing very, very destabilized. You know, the cyclones are more furious. There are droughts everywhere. Events are happening around the world at 0.7. So even 1.7 is not going to be easy street. But if you get up to 6 degrees, and if I kind of, I'm trying to find an analogy, and if you sort of say well, your body temperature, you know, if your body in temperature increases by one point degrees centigrade, you feel like you've got the flu. You can still operate, but you're just kind of a little bit under the weather. But, you know, you can operate. If, you're a point, if you go six degrees in terms of your body, you're dead. You know, that's the point when you've gone beyond fever, beyond hope, beyond your... You don't exist. So these temperatures, although they might sound very small, are very, very serious. So that's the kind of... The little middle, middle bottom bit I'm going to refer to later on, six trillion dollars, sounds, it's a huge, huge sum of money. That is what the fossil industry is going to invest in finding more fuel, more reso sort of reserves of oil, gas and coal over the next ten years. That's the budget they've got to spend. None of it, I mean, for all sorts of reasons that I'll get to explain, it has no value. So to throw that kind of money at something that will have no value, is, is just mind-blowing. Anyway, we get on to that. Um, this is coming from the Resilience Center, which is in Stockholm. You know, it actually maps the whole temperature range of when human beings existed. You know, not well, pretty much 90,000 90, years ago. You go right through all of the kind of fluctuations. We were nomadic. We were just about surviving in bits of the planet. We would move from A to B in order to find good places to live. And then we started the beginning of agriculture. And the whole of civilization, as we know it, lives in the Holocene. You know, what is amazing about that really flat bit of the graph is, A, it's unusual. It's not usual. We've been, you know, it's a really, really strange event that's happened. And the temperature range is plus or minus 0.5 degrees. So we're already pushing ourselves out of that balance. And we're now in the Anthropocene. So, you know, we've had the absolute luxury of actually, in, you know, having the best climatic situation in order to develop our civilizations. So we have to work hard in order to continue that place. Why art? Why is art important? What I've just shown you, in a way, is scientific facts. You know, the scientists have worked incredibly hard to actually establish the facts of what the situation is. You know, they're as seriously, they're as, they're as concrete as gravity. These are serious facts. But the thing is, what do those facts really mean to us as, as, as people, as a culture? And I think that's where the art comes in. They take these things and say, well, actually, those hardcore, you know, logical, rational facts mean this to us. And where the artist comes in is to actually struggle to actually give meaning to that kind of data. So us working away as artists work on those facts and say, well, actually, how does that resound? How will that affect our cultures? I mean, if you know, I mean, it's not, you can just take this, you can take another subject, you know, what's love, how does hate work? You know, giving it meaning, giving it some kind of rounded sense, a condition, is what artists do. That's the territory we work in. So this balance between the art and the science is just almost an essential activity. I'm going to show you a piece of art now. Okay. So out of all this, we worked, one of the loveliest people we've worked with is, is, is the poets. And we've and always had poets with us. And they're now, you know, in my day, it was the, Don, you know, the Dillons and the various people like that. Today, it's the poets are making. This is the Lem Sisse, crafted this piece. And it came under the Darwin celebration. So it, was, it sort of came under that, but it was, he was on the... <laughs> with the jazz quartet. So it's only three minutes long, but it's quite powerful. A lost number in the equation. A simple, understandable miscalculation. What if, on the basis of that, 
The world as we know it changed its matter of fact. Let me get it right. What if we got it wrong? What if we weakened ourselves, getting strong? What if we found in the ground a vial of proof? What if the foundations missed a vital truth? What if the industrial dream sold us out from within? What if our impenetrable defense sealed us in? What if our wanting more was making less? And what if all this wasn't progress? Let me get it right. What if we got it wrong? What if we weakened ourselves getting strong? What if our wanting more was making less? And what if all this it wasn't progress? What if the disappearing rivers of Eritrea, the rising tides and encroaching fear, what if the tear inside the protective skin of Earth was trying to tell us something? Let me get it right. What if we got it wrong? What if we weakened ourselves getting strong? What if the message carried in the wind was saying something. From butterfly wings to the hurricane, it's the small things that make great change and the question towards the end of the lease is no longer the origin but the end of species let me get it right what if we got it wrong what if the message carried in the wind was saying something so in a way that I I mean, a lot of what I've been talking about just Lem somehow sum, sums it up within three minutes. I don't know how it is. Brilliant piece of poetry. This was actually February this year. This is Bob Dudley, CEO of BP, and it's a very interesting statement because he actually says that he's absolutely, totally aware that climate change is real. And all of the data that he's got, and, you know, oil companies, they're really, really accurate on their data that, that you know, we, the, the, the demand for LNG will increase to such an extent. And as far as they've done the mapping, the only way to produce that energy is to actually have fossil fuel use, burn fossil fuels. If, oh well, when they burn those fossil fuels, he knows it will go outside the limits of scientific inquiry you know, the scientific limits that are given. So he's sort of saying, well, fine, but this kind of... In a way, this is the kind of serious questions we are trying to address. You know, these, these guys know the scenario. They know what's happening. They know what will happen, but where is the, the kind of morality of the market that allows this to happen? You know, if you look at the top ten companies in the world on the stock market, eight of them, are reliant on fossil fuel for their existence. So you kind of go, well, you know, how do you then stop this enormous machine, change it in direction, so that it actually becomes sustainable and builds something we can all live by into the future? At the same time, they're getting so desperate to find this stuff, it is much more difficult to find it. So this is what the landscapes look like. And this is the tar sands in Canada, the Ed Patinsky photograph. You know, if we have to do this to the planet in order to get the fuel that we need out of the ground that we know is going to damage ourselves, you suddenly feel, you know, this is the quandary we're in. How do we get out of that quandary? How do we get out of this kind of... It, it, it's sort of blinding, but at the same time, it's, you know, so difficult to actually change the direction. No, is it? I mean, I mean, I'm sort of the only activist slide I'm going to show you, but divest, divest is 
one of the ways of, and this is actually making an, a, a real mark, you know, don't put your money in to investment programs that are reliant totally, you know, if we can start draining, sort of cutting off the umbilical cord of, of money that these companies need to that six trillion dollars, tell them that there's another way to go about it, then actually that's one way forward. But whichever way we're doing it, we're discounting the future. We're, like, we're carrying on this. Interesting, we made this in 2008, and I made it with Amy Balkan. I mean, she half gave me that piece of text. Discounting the future was actually the term the bankers were used before the crash. And they said, okay, we can carry on, blah, 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 dis discount the future, it doesn't matter. Nothing's going to happen. We're so assured of our program that it's just going to be fine. You know, and then about three months, actually, it was only one month after we did that, projecting that onto the ice, the whole banking system collapsed. They didn't actually figure the future out into their systems. And we're doing exactly the same thing in terms of the energy we use. We're discounting the future. Now, I'm just going to do one other, the other part of the discounting the future is that, you know, that's about our lives. That's about the way we live. But there is a scientific kind of corrality here. De Deborah Inglese Rodriguez is an amazing scientist and I did two years work with her and the artwork that we created is downstairs in the show. Her speciality is looking at coccolithophores. Coccolithophores are so small you need an electron microscope to see them. They're for, you know, you cannot see them with an egg, you can't even see them with a normal microscope, you need an electron microscope. The blooms that they produce are, you know, the size of the North Sea. There are ginormous blooms that they will produce when the sea temperature gets right. And the amount of, so they live off carbon. What they do is take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn it into calcium carbonate, just by creating the kind of extraordinary shell straight structures. So working with Deborah, we actually came up with this artwork. And again, you know, we're using the oceans. The bit that we don't see, the, the kind of oceans are the lungs of the planet. They are so important. Without, you know, all of the carbon, something like 70% of the carbon dioxide we throw into the atmosphere is absorbed by the oceans. The oceans are becoming more acidic, which actually is affecting the chance that these creatures can carry on multiplying. They have a very complicated life. How do you keep that balance and going? And we all look at the ocean and we think, oh, it's just the sea out there. Those, that sea, you know, something like over 90% of the living organisms on the planet live in the sea. So, you know, this huge thing that we don't see is another thing that we've got to protect. And we have no kind of notion of actually how to do that. So Deborah's whole work is to look at the strength of these coccolithophores, how are they surviving in the modern, you know, in the modern, as the oceans become more acidic, sea temperatures rise, do they survive? So that's her whole work, and she just spends her whole life dedicated to trying and finding out how that is. It's, an, you know, it's extraordinary work. And that's what you get. It's amazing. I, you know, I never knew this. Chalk cliffs, all chalk cliffs are 100% dead shells of coccolithophores and other marine animals. So the biggest carbon sink is not coal or oil. It's actually the chalk cliffs, completely innate. But the other thing is that, and you know, if you just take one centimeter of that chalk cliff, represents 10,000 years of coccolithophores. This is nature's way of actually balancing the system of the planet. But unfortunately, we're now in the Anthropocene. We've now moved beyond how nature can cope with the whole structure. We're going too fast. You know, 10,000 years, one layer of chalk, that's how it works. In 200 years, we've, been, you know, we've created the Industrial Revolution. We've managed to get all of this carbon fuels out of, the, out of the soil, burn them, put all that carbon dioxide. You know, we are now in charge of our own fate. So, you know, this is another piece of sort of writing that, again, it went through the peer review. So it's odd that you actually can write a cultural paper that actually can go through peer review. I mean, the scientists and the way they did it, that is quite an extraordinary process. So actually, you know, this was it. But it also it's about climate is culture. This is no longer about the science. This is about the way we live. It's the culture we live in. And the challenge is, can we actually engage with that culture and reinvent it and actually come up with something that's really sort of lasting and take that really difficult questions of the oil companies working in one way and actually reinvent it actually to build a really resilient and sustainable culture. 
So that's the game we're in. And instead of asking the artist to actually look at the science and try and engage with climate science, can they actually engage with culture? So that's where we're at on that. I'm going to introduce a new character into the thing. There's a guy called Tom Rand, who's an entrepreneur. He also has a doctorate in philosophy, but he is a clean tech entrepreneur, and he works out of uh, Toronto in Canada. He's chair of my board of the foundation we have in Toronto. And this is, there's going to be three little clips of him talking about the situation we're in. One of the reasons it's so difficult to really believe in climate disruption is because it runs counter to many of our other beliefs, like tomorrow is better than today, the economy can grow forever, human ingenuity solves all problems. So we have to get past those mental defenses, and that's why creative communication about climate disruption and about solutions is so important. So we're back to climate, you know, culture. Climate is culture. That's what we're talking about. So then how do we set up the scenario where we can get artists to engage with that? How do we, you know, by taking the artists up into the, into the Arctic with the scientists, that's how we dealt with, you know, the climate change as an idea. But if we now say, okay, how do you think about culture? How do you get artists engaged with that process? In Toronto, we set up the Carbon 14, which was a festival that we organized that went on for four months. In order to start it, we, didn't, we had a, what we call an expedition, but we didn't go anywhere. So we actually got these people together. We got 20 really creative souls from right across the platform, in together with a room with seven informers, what we called informers. So you had a scientist, you also had a new thinking economist, you had a politician, you had an th eco-theology, you know, this was the kind of, so each of them would say to the, the creatives, this is how I see the world, this is my structure of the world. After these about three days really intensive kind of engagement, we then said, well, okay, we then took them to this, you know, the ROM, the Royal Ontario Museum, and said, well, okay, this is the gallery we're going to be showing at in two years' time. And therefore, the challenge is for you to think about this and actually come back and make work that we can put in the gallery. Or if it's theatre work, we'll do it elsewhere. Now, I can't show you all of the work, but actually it was an incredible I mean, success in terms of the artist engaging with that. And I can only, I'm just going to show you one, one example of what this was, and it's kind of interesting. I don't know if you know who David Suzuki is. He's the kind of the biggest kind of climate person in Canada. He's, I mean, he is really a cultural hero. David Suzuki, what we did was, and this is an artwork by Laurie Brown. Laurie Brown actually has her own radio show every night, and it's, a, it's called Signal. It's one of the best radio shows on the planet, and it's between 10 and midnight every night. And that was, you know, she was the creative soul. She took the Suzuki idea, and she went to David Suzuki and said, well, what happens if I put you on trial? We're going to make a mock trial, or a real trial, a theatrical trial. And we're going to put it, and David really embraced it. And he said, well, I've, I've been waiting for this. I'm going to create a manifesto that actually is sedition. And the idea was that he would make this manifesto that actually would be such an, a kind of statement that actually it proposed it to bring down the Canadian government. You know, it was treason. I mean, we called it sedition because it's less. But also we then said, well, it's seditious libel. So actually, okay, he would put, might be good. So then the idea was we put him on trial, we'd have this mock trial, we'd have a whole bit of publicity around it. That's the, you know, the launch of it, and we kind of the whole, we you know, this is real media. We actually managed to get the media cameras there, the tell you know, the radio, everybody was there. We're going to put David Suzuki on trial for sedition. And then in the Rome Royal Ontario Museum, we had an audience of over 400 people. We had David there in dock. We created this piece of theater. We actually had a prosecution witness, a, a defense lawyer, um, a prosecution lawyer, um, judge. And we then had a lay jury. And at the same time, this was broadcast on the internet. So the internet could also vote whether he was guilty or not guilty. And he would defend his argument. And he published this manifesto. Um, you're not going to probably be able to read it all now, but you can go online to, and it's stated on, on our website. But, you know, a lot of it, like intergenerational crime. You know, we are doing things now in a way like the, the BP statement. We're doing things now, which actually knows it will be bad for our children's lives. 
found intergenerational crime was one of the statements. Anyway, so David published this manifesto. He was totally at odds with the Canadian government. It was sedition. He wanted to bring down the Canadian government because he thought they were acting so irresponsibly. Obviously, this caused a big kind of media scrum, you know, scrum for us. It was a great big piece of provocative art. That's what it was state, stated as. Thankfully, at the end of the day, although he was probably guilty of sedition, he wasn't guilty of seditious libel. He wasn't actually telling any lies. So the trial went ahead and blah, blah, blah. There was a kind of fallback from it, is that the prosecution uh, lawyers lost a huge government contract on the basis of them being there. The judge was actually hauled before the law council and said, well, this was not the right behavior for it. I mean, you know, this was a piece of theater. This wasn't actually real, but at the same time, you know, it really unraveled the feathers of everybody coming down. Lots of people think we need fossil fuels to keep our economy humming, and it's simply not true. Alternative energies are ready to step up to the job. We have capital sitting in our pension funds to deploy that technology. And we know what policy tools will unlock the capital, i.e. a price on carbon. It's a myth we need fossil fuels. We can kick the habit. So in a way, okay, we can get there. One of the things that, you know, one of the tools that we would actually achieve to do this is to, um, you know, put a price on carbon. It's quite extraordinary. You know, every other piece of waste we produce, you know, we get the garbage man, we're happy to pay for the garbage man, we pay taxes to have it cleaned up. You know, every other thing that we produce that has a byproduct, we are happy to pay for somebody to actually make sure that it doesn't mess up our streets, mess up, you know, we pay for the sewerage, we pay for everything. We are dumping all of our waste into the atmosphere in terms of carbon dioxide, we know it's dangerous for us, and we're not willing to pay for it. So the idea is to put a price on carbon. The silver bullet, in a way what Tom terms, and a lot of people have done a lot of research into this, is, you know, I, I created a silver bullet that weighed seven ounces of pure silver. The kind of cost, the value of that was $180. If you actually put a price on every ton of carbon dioxide you pumped into the atmosphere, which is quite reasonable, because that in a way is cleaning it up. I mean, it was, but it has to be that level of $180. You know, there's already a price, well, you had a price on carbon here. But there was, you know, British Columbia have done it. It's been incredibly successful. They've gone up to $30 per ton. They can't go higher unless everybody else does it, otherwise we penalize them. But if we get it up to $180, you know, you suddenly have a load of money to reinvest into clean tech. Clean tech can step up to the plate and it can actually deliver. So that's the mechanism for doing it. It also unlocks the pension funds who will not invest in the coal industry or the tar industry, I mean the carbon industry. So it is a kind of, you know, that little piece of art in a way, which is again in my show downstairs, the silver bullet of change. And if you can't, this is, Tom did a book, you know, you don't, that red square there, which happens to be in the Sahara Desert, but I could actually put it in the middle of Australia, that amount of solar energy falling on that piece of desert is the, all of the energy we need in the world. You know, there are so many ways, I mean, that early picture of the sun, yes, we can do this, it is not a problem. We just need to engage and switch it, switch the mentality away from, you know, one thing to another in order to actually produce this the kind of activity we need. And the smart grid, Tom's going to talk, you know, there are different ways of doing it, but you've just got to have this interconnectivity. I mean, you know, if you had that amount of solar energy generated in the mid middle of Australia, you could have a cable that actually went and you could sell it to the Indonesia, to the Philippines, to China, just by taking it down an electricity cable. So there are loads of ways that we can engage in doing this. So, okay, back to the art bit. How does the art, how does culture fit into this? They're building the Swansea Tidal Lagoon in, in Wales, in the south coast of, of, of Wales. What happens at Swansea, you've got a tidal range of something like 14 metres. So the amount that goes in and out of that is an amazing amount of energy. If you build this 18 kilometre wall around, you know, Swansea Bay, and the energy coming in and out, so Cape Farewell got very involved with this right from the beginning. And four years ago, we became the cultural partners because you cannot do that without actually taking Swansea with you. You know, you want them to be on board. You want the people of Swansea to think of this thing and say, wow, what a great idea. 
So we became the cultural partners. We worked with the universities there. We worked with, you know, the, 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 the NGOs. We also worked with the council. And there's an amazing kind of buy-in to this idea that you can build this thing. Just it, um, the guy who they're building it, what the, if you can imagine all of the water in this room, if this room was completely full of water, in one third of a second, that's how much goes through those gates. So you can see the amount of energy coming in and out. You know, it's guaranteed, you can say any point 60 years into the future, exactly at some point the amount of energy you're going to get. And the idea is if we build six of these babies, a bit bigger, around the coast of England, that's 10% of our energy needs. Just pure technology. It's going to happen, and probably in four years' time it'll be there. But what they wanted us to do is to make it a culture. So we put out a competition worldwide for any kind of piece of sculpture or artwork that could sit in the Swansea Bay Lagoon. And um, we got over 100 of replies, really worked our programs, and we've now whittled it down to eight commissions that we're going to make. This is the wall itself. That's what it looked like. And then one of the commissions, what the, the brief to the artist was that something, it had to have something to do with the concept of the tidal lagoon. So we got a lot of moon, moon kind of, you know, obviously the moon causes the tide, so there's a lot of beautiful moon things. Mariella has come up with this lovely idea that you build this huge moon that will just sit above the water. Um, it will just sit out there. Um, the other interesting thing is it faces south, so the dark side of the moon, which you never see, is going to be all solar panels, which will generate the energy for the light that's going to shine on it at night. So it's a beautiful structure. And then the second piece, which is another little two-minute piece of film, is another proposal by a German artist. And this, it's, it's just very interesting what art does and what they can come up with. Timo van Kriegstein takes in his work the key element of the Tidal Lagoon project to be the following social paradigm shift. The pursuit of a resilient approach to furthering the interests of the community in concert with the power of nature rather than against it. A vessel is birthed in the deepest part of the lagoon. Its cargo, consisting of various stacked containers, are affixed to the bottom of the lagoon. The vessel flows down with the low tide. The water level decreases with the ebb and the container resurface. At the point at which all the containers have resurfaced from the water, a mechanism in the lowest one opens all the hatches and the water pours down like a waterfall. The waterfall runs between 20 to 60 seconds. With the rising water level of the tide, the process starts over from the beginning. The container is an allegory. It reveals an uncomfortable lot about our society. In its restless cycle of being permanently loaded and unloaded, it resembles Sisyphus. It signifies how dependent we are on international trade. These are the two topics Swan Sea Change deals with. The continued global trade visible through transfer sites like ports and harbors on one hand and on the other the natural power of the environment that surrounds us. Is it possible to combine those two? Do we have to protect ourselves from environmental incidents? Or could we possibly use nature without exploiting it? So what's going to happen over the period of time is that, you know, that when this lagoon, I mean, it's going to cost a billion pounds to build this lagoon. So it's a serious sum of money. But we're actually going to have, you know, nine artworks within the lagoon. So it will be, you know, the first power station that becomes like a place to go and visit. You know, so the power is not, the power stations are not hidden some other place. They're actually right in the middle of our culture and the, the, the way the energy is generated. So we will have this incredible sculpture park. And you have works like that, which actually are very challenging and, and, and kind of make you question, you know, how does, you know, the art questions the whole idea of, of how this thing, you know, the significance of, you know, 
kind of the, the meaning of the kind of energy that we're using, and then we'd incorporate it. Another one we're doing is we tried in the energy renaissance, the Isle of Wight, which is in the south coast of England. You know, you have a population of 140,000 people on this island, a sophisticated society. And we were working with designers and the new kind of concept, new creative designers, and say, you know, how would it look if we deeply decarbonized the Isle of Wight? If we kind of, every, all the energy that was used on the Isle of Wight was actually produced as, with non-carbon activity. So we're trying to map what the society would look like. And part of that is to actually take away the threat and say, wait a minute, the society we're trying to create is a kind of new renaissance. It's somewhere exciting. So that demystify the future, get embrace the future, get excited by it. So that's one of the other. And it's a place full of data. I mean, they, you know, it's a good transport system so that we've got the data of the amount of energy they use, the amount of water we use. The council have got all this data. So we just kind of try and put it all together and actually say, wait a minute, the future could be like this. So we're asking the you know, creative sector, the designers, to actually start mapping the future in a way that the mathematical modelers map the scientific future. This is um, by Arup Engineering. Arup Engineering, you know, they, they, they kind of wanted to try and show that if you took a city, you know, if you upscale this now to a city, what are the kind of things you can do to a city to actually make the city work better? You know, completely kind of integrate it. You do, you know, you make the buildings much more resilient. You put all sorts of things, traffic, you know, all of the kind of boring things in a way. There's a program, C40 Cities. Um, I don't know if you've come across it, but the idea is, you know, 70% of the world's population is going to live in cities in about 10 years' time. So if you can decarbonize the cities. So the idea is that, you know, I'm sure, actually, I'm sure Melbourne is one of the cities is that the mayor is kind of going, we can take, actually, we can decarbonize, we can lower the carbon level of that city. And 40 cities around the world, I mean, even more, are doing this right now. So, you know, you don't need these big international agreements. It can actually be done on a city level. And the kind of things that you can do by putting in solar, by, you know, retrofitting buildings, you don't have to shake up and down the city. So this is what the Arab engineering, they just so show this kind of activity. And this is just normal behavior. But actually, it is a way of going into the future and being excited by it. Um, the city they took here is Manchester, which ironically is where the Industrial Revolution started. So, you know, it's quite nice that they took that. And, you know, just information of structures, information of transport, you know, it's quite boring stuff, but it's actually really, really important. And again, it's really creative design. You're using the best of design, the best of creative endeavor to make this work, the best of architectural activity. So it is all possible. But again, it's creating a creative future that we all have to live by. So climate again, I'm going to say it again, climate is culture, it's, you know, but we've got to ramp it up. We've got to ramp up, we've got to almost attack it on an industrial level. We've got to do it city-wide, not building-wide. I mean, this building is a really good building. But if we did it right across the city, you know, get excited by that activity. Freed in art limit. One of the, um, you probably all know, it's what I was saying, these big international agreements, maybe COP21 in Paris will come up with the agreements that actually means that they would really, really take the carbon out of our activity, I mean our energy sector. I'm not that optimistic, but at the same time, we, what we've done is we've launched our COP21 with our partners in Paris, and the idea is that while they're on high on the hill trying to figure out the COP21 treaties, we're actually going to do it city-wide level. We're going to completely bring all of the cultural activity that all has to do with climate into the city, pieces of theatre, pieces of exhibitions, and do it as a city-wide activity. But we also want to do it that people shouldn't have to go to Paris, so we're trying to link it into cities like Melbourne, we hope, that other events will happen, cultural events will happen across the planet that will kind of find maybe a different way of actually thinking and looking about this and getting excited by it. So that's the ambition for Paris. One of the things we're doing also, and we're doing this at the Pompidou, um, we're having a summit of creatives. And the idea of the summit of creatives is that we get this for two days, we will all get together 
instead of sitting, you actually have to work and come up with a creative kind of blueprint of the way of what the way is looking into the future. You know, what would those rules and regulations be that we could actually export? So that is the idea for, for, for Paris. Just going to pay, this is the final piece of Tom. What we're going to build is the energy internet, the smart grid. So it's solar from some parts of the continent, wind from others, wind onshore, wind offshore, biomass, geothermal, energy storage, tidal. And you put all those together and what you have is an energy dance. And you match that dance with demand. That's called the smart grid. We have an amazing opportunity to be the ones that when future generations look back, they did it. They did it, they turned, they turned their, their world upside down and they changed what had happened for 100 plus years. I mean, Marcus was great. He was a comedian that we worked with. And in a way, he was such a relief to me because whenever you were talking about climate change, it was always a tragedy. And he came in and said, no, it's just a comedy of errors. It's a comedy of human engagement that's just not getting on. It was just light in the spirit. But then he comes up with that lovely statement, yes, in 20 years' time, wouldn't it be great if we actually turned everything around and we built this future that we could all be, could be resilient? So that is, in a way, the ambition. That's the target. And this Obama quote, which came out again is in the show downstairs, you know, there's so much debate. I mean, when he, Ian McEwan, when we started off, you know, Ian, it's, it, you know, it's like maybe not my children, but my children's children. And now suddenly we're realizing, you know, the destabilizer of the weather systems is actually cranking up so fast that actually we're talking about our children's generation. It's only one generation away. And that's the time scale that we really should be working within. And it's exciting, you know, I mean, it, you know, we have that chance to do it and really transform the societies we can, you know, all live by. So that's, that's the, again, the ambition. And yes, another world is possible. And when I started, I mean, in, when, what really, when I started this as an artist, I kind of, what really intrigued me about what the scientists were doing is that they suddenly had developed these models, you know, these huge mathematical models that could say that actually in five years time, 20 years time, 30 years time, this is what will happen with a really good degree of accuracy. That's the tool they invented. And I was, you know, I was just really intrigued as if there could be an equivalent that you could find for the cultural sector. You know, you know artists always dream of the future. You know, another world is possible, it's a dream. But actually, could we actually build the tools that another world is possible by building it through creative activity? So this kind of notion that um, you kind of, you have the capability of kind of interrogating the future. You know, what artists do is it's sort of, it's like action-based research. If you want to look for, you know, research is good for looking at now backwards. But actually, what happens if you wanted to research the future? So what an artist will do is to make an object, a piece of art, then put it out into the public domain. And we'll see if it works, if it resonates, if it, it's a good way of thinking. So a lot of the work that Cape Verde does is using this notion of kind of action-based research. We're trying to interrogate the future, and that's the model, that's the kind of art that we're building, which is kind of an exciting place to be, just on an art, art level. But on the other hand, at the same time, it has such significance in the cultures we're all trying to build. So I'm going to finally say this. Climate is culture. It is a great way of going forward. And there is so much more I could show you in terms of art, but I'm willing to take Q&A. <laughs> So, um, thank you very much, David. Um, and yes, we do have uh, 15, uh, 20 minutes for some questions. Um, I'm actually going to use my chair's um, <laughs> prerogative. prerogative to ask an opening question. And it's, and it's, one, um, it's one about the, um, well, it builds on your comments about comedy and tragedy, I suppose. And it's that um, kind of four-letter word that we wrestle with called hope. Um, and I guess, you know, knowing a range of people in the audience um, I'm sure there's lots of people here tonight um, who've been working on climate change for many years and I'm also sure that many of us struggle, as I do, to hold together a, an honest assessment of the risks we face 
um, with the sense of hope and possibility that we need to get up each day and take action and so on. So my question is, how does that struggle between the harsh reality, hope, despair, grief, determination, how does that play out in the lives uh, and the work of the artists you work with and perhaps how does that play out in your own life and work? Um, how do we hold together yeah. those, those thoughts? In kind of a, I'll try and give this a, a human scale little story because that's what artists do. Marcus Brigstock, the comedian, you know, he came up to the artist with, with, art with me and he came back and he was like fired up and he was going and he, going, and he tried to sell a program to the BBC and he tried to do this and nothing took traction. And he actually went into deep despair. I mean, comedians are famous for riding between highs and lows. And he really, really stunk, sunk into despair. And that somehow he suddenly then had his, you know, that's an artist who's been deeply affected by the activity. How do you then kind of live with that? Knowing that, you know, we're, it's great you're all here, but at the same time there's a lot of people out there who just don't give a damn or are working in the opposite direction. So there's a reality check always that we're still a small group of international people trying to really give this traction and make it happen. But at the same time, if you really take it on board, you kind of go, oh my God, this is hopeless. I think what's happened to me in the last, there was a, I went to a conference in Vancouver. I mean, actually it's the guy Tom, you know, that there are new technologies. There is this whole world of clean tech. And I was at a conference in Vancouver. There were 6,000 people there, all clean tech specialists, deciding how this industry will go. And in Canada, the clean tech industry is bigger than the tar sands industry. So it's like, oh, wait a minute. You know, they're already working at it. You know, like the Swansea Tidal Bay Lagoon. You know, it is happening. It just needs to be upscaled. And the divest bone, if you take the money out of that and put it into clean tech, you know, everybody's going to make more money. The jobs are going to be... So I think that's a recent thing. You know, that's only happened in the last two years. I've been registering this and going, oh, wait a minute, there is a way out of this. But at the same time, I'm a bit like, you know, if I really take a reality check, then I go, wait a minute, we're still a small band of people trying to instigate change or be part of the change, the building of the change. So I don't know which way it will go right now. There are some roving mics, I believe. Whereabouts are we? Yes, up there. Can I have some questions? There's one right up the back, I think. Um, if you can take a mic up there. Look, um, I love the artwork, but how do you know it's actually having any impact? How do you know it's making a difference? Yeah, measurement. Um, you're not the first to answer, and actually, you know, we're funded by the public purse or we're funded by foundations, so it's a big question that's always asked. We're actually working with the University of Trondheim. They're doing a psychological, you know, they're doing a psychological study to actually evaluate whether art does have an effect on populations. So we are trying to find those measurement criteria. But there's also that notion of, okay, I'm going to throw it back at you guys, everybody. I'm sure there is something that is it happened in your life, a piece of art that is really, you carry with you. It's embedded in your, your psyche. You know, it could be a book, it can be a pop music, it could be a poem, it could be a painting, it could be a film. But there's something in there that you kind of always half refer to and it might change over years, but it is embedded in your psyche. That's how powerful art is. But at the same time, you know, how do you measure that? You kind of go, you know, but it is inform who we are as human beings. Culture, any culture that evolves always has art at its center. And it's a human need, it's a human expression. And how then do you evaluate whether it's powerful or not? And in this sense, how do we evaluate, actually, are we having an effect? Now, I could take kind of, you know, I mean, nowadays, if you ask, you know, actually, we've got all three political parties in England, all except that climate change is a total reality, and they're trying to work with it. You get 95%, they've done the surveys, and the English population believe that climate change is a reality, and 60% want actually government money to go, taxpayers' money to go into finding solutions. Now, I could argue that that's all because Kate Farewell started up working 15 years ago. <laughs> you know, it's not, but there is a side change, but we are part of that change. And it's, you know, like, but again, it's, you know, how do you exactly value it? And it's, that's the difficult thing. But maybe the measurement system, the notion that you have to measure everything, you know, where's the meaning of something? 
Can you measure that kind of meaning? I'm not sure. But we are trying to do the measurement at the same time, because obviously the funding, but at the same time, you know, we just know whether something's right or not, and that's the glory and the value of art. Okay, there's a question up the woman in purple. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm just intrigued to know um, if you, ha if the CEOs of, of any of the oil or gas companies have been uh, able to come along on your expeditions and how often they do actually come to the party, the, the cultural party, you know, with, with your, um, you know, with your, your projects. Interesting one. Um, of the oil companies, I'm not sure. It's funny because in a way it's the same, you know, would we take money from the oil companies in order to, I mean, it would be great. I mean, they have offered us rather large sums of money the problem is if we take money from the oil companies, you know, who's, where's the integrity of the message? And if it skews our message, then we don't take that money because people just look at us from the outside and go, they shouldn't take that money. I know the second part of your question is all right. Should we embrace them in conversation? Should we have them inside the tent? Um, I'm trying to think if we... Hmm... I will ponder that. No, we have thought about it, but I'm not sure how they would engage. There are actually, no, there are people, the people who are head of the, you know, we've worked with people who are head of the fishing industry, so which is like a simile, you know, how do you, you know, they're always, you know, everybody goes, oh my God, they're plundering the planet of fish, but at the same time, they're part of the solution, so it is a good part of a conversation to go forward. I mean, BP used to be called Beyond Petroleum, you know, 15 years ago, they had a whole campaign that they were going to invest in clean tech, and they stopped it. I don't quite know quite why. I mean, there's a fight at the moment to actually get them to release the data that they have to actually say, you know, to justify why they stopped it. David, if you had um, the CEO of one of these companies, or even just hypothetically the Prime Minister of a country who wasn't entirely on board with this question, just hypothetically, what... what artwork would you confront them with? What oh, I don't know. I wouldn't know because that's what's so nice about us all being together in the boat. It was hilarious. I mean, you know, you can imagine the ferocity of the conversations between the, uh, the creatives and the, the scientists and the debate. And, you know, we're having those same conversations, the same as that question. You're kind of going, you know, this is the ferocity of the debate. You know, the art takes time to make. You can't suddenly switch it on and say, here's the artwork. You know, sometimes it takes years, like Ian McEwan's book. But if they go, one of the CEOs was on the boat, then he would just be in part of that dialogue. The strange thing is, and I'm... Actually, no, I have done this. Um, the, um, in Canada, um, the British Embassy in Canada arranged a dinner where I was a guest of the dinner. And they sat next to me, the CEO of Shell. And he just retired from Shell. So he was a little bit liberated in what he could and could not say. But this was a private dinner within the embassy and it didn't have, you know, didn't have Chapman House rules, can I talk about it? And I said, can I ask him anything? And, yep, I can ask him anything. This guy totally understood climate change. Absolutely got it. So I couldn't have an argument with him. You know, it was like, oh my God, he's on my side. He had kids, he knew the situation, but he said, I cannot do anything about it because the shareholders demand and the, that we make profit in the conventional sense and that's what we have to deliver. So, you know, yeah, I know you've got to... Oh, there was one more up back and then down here, I think. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to follow on from your uh, point about comedians being able to uh, get the message across well and mention that Ben Elton wrote a book called This Other Eden, and I don't know if he's officially part of Cape Farewell, but that certainly, I think, uh, is an absolute match to your aims. Oh, I, I mean, yeah, I, brilliant. I know the book. Great. Good for him. You know, there are a lot of people out there doing fantastic work. They don't have to be, I mean, you know, all the climate work being done here. So that it's just a band of people. It is interesting that he stepped up to the plate. The other thing is, I mean, are, if you just take the creators, what we do is deal with the milieu of our times. You know, the things that are really affecting us, our cultures, you will, that's the territory you'll find artists working in. 
So it's not surprising that there are so many artists wanting to step up to the plate and going, this is the big issue of our times. And therefore, I want to have a debate. I want to engage with it and work quite some. But Elton was, yes, just another comedian. But there are others on the com comedy line that have done that. Now, I've got a question down here. The person over there with the mic hasn't had any work to do yet, so I want a couple of people from that side. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, David, um, you ended your presentation with uh, the byline, Another World is Possible. And you gave a lot of examples of what people call ecological modernization, a renewable source of energy, energy efficiency, and so forth. But that byline, as you probably know, uh, comes from the anti-globalization movement or uh, the social justice movement or the anti-corporate globalization movement. And we live in a world where there's differential access to resources resources, the, the utilization which uh, uh, contributes to, to climate change. Uh, as an artist, uh, I'm, I'm wondering how you're going to grapple with that. I, I don't know if you grapple with that in some of your artwork or whether you have ideas uh, in that direction. I mean, I think another world is possible came before even then, but I mean, because another world is always possible. I can probably find it in Shakespeare if I look hard enough in the same kind of framework. Yes, but in answer to your question, I don't know how society will form or build itself. I don't really want to know. I don't want to, you know, it's not for us to kind of lay it down. I'm in no utopian structure. I just need there are certain hurdles and certain measurements to get over. I do think, I am convinced that in society 20, 30 years down, a bit like Marcus, Brigstock said, if we really manage to turn our world upside down and achieve the change in the clean kind of environment, that we, it will actually define a completely different set of values that we live by, like less consumerism, you know, that kind of thing. But in a way, how that plays out is not my responsibility. I mean, yes, there are a lot of people speculating in that territory. I mean, economists now are fighting each other. I mean, they're, you know, what a, you know, they're a really interesting tribe, but they're getting two of them to agree with each other is very difficult. So a lot of people are thinking in that territory. And if an artist wants to interrogate that territory, great. But it's not for me to kind of go, it is going to be like this, because um, I have my own views on it, and I just know that society will be different. And actually, I don't. I think it's just exciting evolving a society rather than kind of going, these are the boundaries to which a society will happen. But I don't exactly know how it will plan out. Have we got one, I don't, one, for one sure. or two over this side? Yes, one here. We'll take one or two more, and then I know David's got one final film clip he wants to show you as well before we finish. Um, just going back to the trial of David Suzuki and how you were presenting that as him being on trial for sedition, I was just wondering if um, how it had seen that it reversed where, say, the government was on trial. <laughs> Just in terms of there's a growing body of um, legal arguments on public trust law, which dates back to Roman times. There's a recent book, Nature's Trust, by Mary Christina Wood, and an article that came out last year um, looking at public trust law in relation to, that could be used for climate change um, in regards to English common law and the Magna Carta. So how that sort of trial, if you're making that sort of more public, or it, how can you revise that to see that the government are in the wrong rather than the activists? Yeah, I mean, actually, by putting Suzuki on trial, we were really putting Harper on trial. I mean, the, 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 the prosecution lawyers actually had to use Harper argument to prosecute David. So in a way, there was the trial between the two camps. So one sense. There is um, there's a notion of the commons, which I just, in a way, partly to your answer, is that is the one of the things that I found the most exciting. And it, I don't know if there are any internet, I mean, program builders here. It's extraordinary. If you write software, you ought to always do it on the level of somebody else. And there is this notion of commons that somebody will write a piece of software. You are allowed then to take that piece of software and put it in, take it to another layer or another direction. That then software then becomes in the public domain. You do not own it. It's the commons. And that's building. And I just love that as a structure. I just think it's such a healthy kind of generous way of living. 
and not saying this is mine this is actually a shared piece of information so in a way if you go back to the Magna Carta well, that's a flawed piece of anyway but it was a very interesting piece of document interesting that actually every every piece of um, kind of manifesto has always been done especially with the Magna Carta and you can understand why when it came it's always a legal structure and what is nice this bad notion of the commons it's not a legal structure it's a different you know it actually lawyers don't have any part of it so it is a different kind of manifesto or blueprint this is why we say a cultural blueprint which is what we're trying to debate going forward so maybe there's a new agreement that we can all agree on that actually we just do it as because it's the right thing to do but it doesn't have the legal status that a manifesto has always had I'm speculating, but, but uh, yes, we, we, we were putting the government on trial by putting Suzuki on trial. Um, oddly enough, Harper didn't volunteer to be on trial. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. So well, you've got a guy to, here somewhere. We're going to wind up, I think, um, in a minute, but I think you have a short video you'd like us to see. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, a bit, <laughs> this is always artists standing up to be knocked over. Um, it's, I, I'd love to end up with a piece of art because that's what we're really talking and what it's all about. And this is a piece of art. Now, actually, it came back on one of the journeys where we had, we had a lot of fantastic musicians on board. So we had K.D. Tunstall and Robin Hitchcock were the two who wrote this piece. Um, we also had Jarvis Cocker and you know, Laurie Anderson and whatever. But the piece of art that came out came out because we were in the same place at the same time struggling to find a solution. And it was the three of us, me being the video artist and these two being the kind of song masters. And this little three minute kind of like almost little pop video is what came out of it. So it would be nice just to end on that. So I'll pass over to David with this and then I'd just like to say a couple of thank yous and then we'll wind up for the evening. I'm going to switch the lights out. So don't be afraid. Okay. Okay. That one would work fine if we get to the end. Yeah. Yeah. And then any of this is perfect. From okay. right on the last one. Oh, last one. You can start there and then very slowly pull the way down.
the only thing left for me to do other than to say thank you for coming is to ask you to thank David Buckland for this evening and for his work. Thank you.